Jane Wilson and Pete had been blissfully married for 12 years. Pete was her everything. He was the firm foundation of her life. Their sex life had become routine and rather dull since Stephanie, their only child, was born three years ago. But she loved him wholeheartedly. Janet has spent the past eight years working for the steel industry. Her former female supervisor had lately been replaced by an attractive, lively young man named Brad Jennings, who was approximately seven years younger than January. Jen felt a growing lust for Brad. She never thought of him as Pete's substitute. She did consider him as a sexual partner. She was continuously staring at Brad, whether he was talking to people or merely going by. She had started having nightmares about the many things she and Brad would do to each other. She only thought of these as wicked thoughts and never tried to act on them. However, these fantasies have now become fully consuming. Throughout her awake hours, she was feeling increasingly nervous, daydreaming about Brad all the time. Pete had mentioned more than once that she appeared to be a million miles away in her thoughts. It appeared like imaginary sexual adventures with Brad were all she could think about now. This appeared to encourage her to be more aggressive with Pete, asking for things they hadn't done in many years in their lovemaking. But even as Pete brought her to a climax, all she could think of was Brad doing it to her. She would have been pleased to continue living her ideal, but events intervened and brought her fantasies to fruition. Brad had asked her to remain late to work on a contract proposal for a key client. He was the ideal gentleman for their nighttime work. Brad grinned and nodded as he reviewed the final text of their proposal. Yes, this is great. Thank you very much. January, why don't I get you dinner as a reward for a job well done? Jan paused for a moment before her desire overpowered her better judgment. Okay, I'll phone Pete and tell him so he doesn't worry. She called their house and when Pete answered, she, Pete, honey, Brad is very pleased with my work tonight. He wants to buy me supper at the company's expense as a thank you. Isn't it wonderful? So it will be a bit later. Getting home safely. Pete was pleased for her. She had conveyed her concerns to Pete several times since Brad had taken over as boss, that Brad did not value her work because he never praised or acknowledged the quality of her efforts, Pete stated. Way to go, honey. You're finally receiving some well-deserved recognition. Enjoy your supper. I have an early appointment tomorrow, so I'll probably be asleep before you arrive home. They both declared their love for each other and hung up. Brad drove Jan to the city's most luxurious restaurant. He was charming, amusing, and attentive to Jan before and during their delightful, candlelit supper. He informed her about his life. He was a Stanford graduate. He received the C on a weekly basis after being divorced for a year and having one daughter. He adored his daughter and showed Jan photos of them together. He still believed he had feelings for his ex, but hoped to someday loose the mental anchor and return to having a relationship with someone. Jan informed him about her family, including her affection for her husband and daughter. On several instances, she reached out and touched Brad's hand while telling him about a family trip or event that she was happy of. Brad paid for supper, and they waited outside the entrance for the valet to bring Brad's car around. Brad placed his arm around Jan's shoulder and kissed her cheek. I had a wonderful experience. Thank you for being such a lovely date, Jan. Against her better judgment, Jan placed her arm around Brad's waist and lightly kissed his lips. I really like this, Brad. Here's a kiss for being an excellent boss. Their hands were just inches apart. Brad's eyes flared up as he glanced at her. He caressed her chin with his index finger before raising her head to stare into her eyes. He pressed his lips against hers, and the two kissed hard. Brad's automobile arrived, and he gently approached it, gripping his employee tightly. He put her in the car and drove them to his apartment without saying a word. Jan had fleeting ideas that what she was doing was wrong, but lust drove reasonable thoughts away. They quickly fell into Brad's king-size bed and spent hours exploring each other's bodies. He did things to her that Pete had never done before. It was well after 1 a.m. They laid weary together. Brad, I need to get home. I really shouldn't have done this. However, you have been a fantasy of mine since you became my supervisor. Brad nodded and added, I've wanted you since the day I started. I was almost terrified to talk to you because I was afraid you'd notice my desire for you. Jennifer, can we do this again? Yes, Brad. We can do it whenever we have the chance. But understand that I do not love you.
I only want sex with you. I adore my family and will do anything to preserve that bond. But I'll do things with you that I would never do with my husband. They then stood and went to the shower to remove the evidence of sex from their bodies. Brad took her back to her car at the office after hastily dressing. They French kissed in the car for a few minutes before Jan broke away. That's enough for now. I need to go home before Pete becomes suspicious. Jen arrived home to see Pete soundly asleep. She considered her spouse as he lay in bed. I love you. This is only a fling. I'm sure I'll become tired of Brad quickly. You will never know, and we will live as husband and wife till our deaths. Brad and Jan spent the next six weeks meeting at various motels, Brad's apartment, Brad's office, and even Jan's living room. They were animals in heat. Brad stated he needed sexual release after more than a year without sex following his divorce. Jen stated that she wanted some crazy, kinky sex to liven up her life. She was even making more suggestions to Pete about trying new things. Peter was skeptical when she proposed he take her in various ways. Where did you learn this, honey? He suddenly felt guilty. She dropped down and looked at Pete. Oh dear, I've been reading too many sex books recently. I apologize if I suggested something you didn't want to do. Peter shook his head. No, not that. I just find you so aggressive these days, and you seem to have prior experience with the tasks you're asking me to complete. You're acting more like a teacher than a lover. Jen nearly panicked. I'm so sorry, darling. I just felt we should try some new stuff. I promised to quit reading novels that gave me these thoughts. Pete simply grinned and hugged her. You can read whatever you want. Please give me some time to adjust to attempting this new stuff, okay? Jen went to work the next day, entered Brad's office, and closed the door. She informed Brad that they would have to cool it for a bit at least. Her spouse was becoming skeptical of her newfound understanding of sexual positions and behaviors. She also felt a little guilty about becoming her husband's sex teacher. Jen, you should inform Pete that we are having sex not as lovers, but as friends with benefits. As they say nowadays, it would surely relieve you of your apparent guilt and make our connection more open and transparent. Pete would simply have to understand that you're just scratching an itch and that it has no meaning for any of us. It would also explain how you discovered and gained experience with these new sex activities. Jen groaned as Brad resumed his massage. Brad said, Are you telling me your sex life at home isn't a million times better since we started doing each other? Jan had to confess that her sex life with Pete had improved dramatically. She leaned in and kissed Brad deeply. God, I do not want to stop this yet. You made me hot and horny after this. For several days, she considered informing Pete about Brad. It was getting increasingly difficult to conceal her interactions with Brad. Pete would be devastated if he found out about Brad through some careless action or statement by her. Jan talked about it with Brad twice more when they met at his flat. I guess I should inform Pete about us. He would be devastated if he found out about us by some silly accident. I believe I can convince him that this is only a fling. And when it's over, everything will be as it was. Except that we will have a far better sexual experience. Brad nodded. Yes, I believe you should. I do not want to be the cause of your breakup or anything like that. I like Pete and I know he loves you a lot. It would harm him if he knew about our adventures. He was so hurt that he considered doing something dumb. You must tell him in a way that lessens his grief and helps him see the long-term outcome. I'll do it tonight. He'll understand. Jan responded. Pete had arrived home from work before Jan and had just taken a shower. He was planning to take her out to dinner tonight with their daughter. He cherished our family time together. These two women dominated his existence. He opened the shower's glass door. He noticed a small drop of water that appeared to be within the glass. Apparently the door had two panes of glass and the water had found its way between them. It was just at a level, so it was difficult to miss the small bubble of water. Pete thought to himself, well, I guess I should get that door fixed. Water should not be able to get inside, therefore we can either disassemble and rebuild the door or just replace it. Pete drifted off and started dressed. Jim strolled in as he was tugging on his trousers. Hello, honey, she said. Hello yourself. You best prepare for dinner. You're running a little late, Pete said. Pete had no way of knowing Jan had come by. Brad is on his way home, and his juices are already pouring down her thigh. This was the first time she had brought indications of Brad home with her, but she needed a boost. That what she was about to tell Pete tonight was the correct thing to do. 
Brad had screwed her, and then they discussed what Jen would say to Pete. Jen turned on the shower and closed the door. Pete used this chance to inform her about the situation with the door and the drop of water. He informed her that the door would either need to be rebuilt or replaced. Pete sucked in his breath as she gently undressed to reveal her underpants and bra. Jan, what? What's on your thigh? There appear to be traces of affection, Pete asked anxiously. It is, my sweetheart, but allow me to explain, okay? It's not what you think, Jan explained. You know, Brad and I, Pete shut her off. What do you mean? It isn't as it seems. Another man's traces of love are trickling from your snatch. It's your boss's signs of affection. You're cheating on me. Pete grasped his head with both hands and sank to the edge of the bed. Jan approached and perched on the edge with Pete. She placed her arm around him. Pete? Yes, I'm having sex with Brad. In truth, it's excellent sex, but it means nothing. I only adore you. Sex with Brad is just that, sex. We're just two pals with perks. It has no significance and makes no difference between you and I. Jen felt pleased about how she was assuring Pete that the romance was meaningless. Pete jumped up. Don't touch me. You dare to have an affair, cheat on me, and then sneak the other man's juices into our bedroom. Get away of my sights. Just go out, Pete. This is also my house. There is no reason for anyone to leave. Anyone. She spoke firmly. As I previously stated, this is only a fling that I expect to end in a few months. I wanted to tell you before you found out in another way and were hurt. This way we can put it in the proper context, and you will realize it means nothing. Pete simply stared at her. It means nothing to our relationship. What is the relationship? You have another man's juices running down your leg and see nothing wrong with it. When did you lose your morality? When did you lose your values? And when did you realize that our marriage vows were meaningless to you? Pete took an overnight bag from the closet and began stuffing shaving supplies, underpants, and a new work shirt inside it. So, my love, if you do not leave, I will. I can't live with a stranger. And you're a stranger. You're not the woman I married. I do not know who you are. I will leave a message about where I will be in a day or so. However, for the time being, stay out of my sight. Pete spoke, his voice quivering with rage. Jen attempted to stop Pete. Honey, we can work it out. Please, let us chat. Pete pushed her hard and she tumbled against the wall, injuring her shoulder. He'd caused her physical pain. This wasn't the Pete she adored. She slapped his face with an open hand. Pete paused and blinked at her. Did you slap me? You say you're cheating on me and then you slap me? Who in the heck are you? Pete maintained a level tone. It's me. I was astounded by your reaction. Throughout our marriage, you never lifted your hand against me. I've just responded. I apologize. It was wrong to do. Are you sorry for slapping or cheating on me? Pete maintained a level tone. My issue with Brad is not cheating. There's no love. It is just lost, and you are benefiting from it. As in our sex lives. It's been amazing since I started screwing Brad. Have you wished for anything? Have I been less than the woman you married? What have you lost in my little games with Brad? What did I lose? I can never trust you again. I lost my dearest friend and sweetheart. I have lost more than you can fathom. Don't you see this? I do not. Jen suddenly brightened. Look, I know how to phrase this. Remember the water bubble in the shower door you mentioned earlier? What I've done and will continue to do until I get it out of my system is nothing more than a drop of water in the shower door. Jen moved on. Is it affecting the door's usability or integrity? No. When that water bubble vanishes, no trace of it remains. The glass remains flawless, and the bathroom floor is still dry. That was the result of my romance with Brad. When it's gone, all that remains is a water bubble in the door. Nothing has changed or been damaged. Pete considered for a moment. Jen, I love you and always will, but I can't accept that your fling isn't affecting our relationship right now. I'll leave you. Do what you believe is best. Remember, as I mentioned about the shower door, the water bubble will require the door to be repaired or replaced. It's the same with our marriage, so make up your mind about that. Pete left the house. Jen had no idea that it would be their last time at the house together. Jen called Brad and explained what had just transpired. Brad suggested she return to his apartment, but Jan declined, claiming she wanted some alone time. Jen still believed Pete had overreacted and would soon come to his senses. Their marriage was strong enough to survive Jan's minor indiscretion. 
Jan fell asleep, wondering about another sex session with Brad. Brad felt empathetic to Jan's home situation, but he also wanted to be with her as she was now. He gets sexual relief. She was skilled at what she did. Brad reasoned that Pete was screwing him. Brad now had her and could use her whatever he saw appropriate for his purposes. If Pete comes to his senses, that's okay. If not, Brad would exploit her until he grew weary of her. Brad was accustomed to vacation cruises. He had been gazing at an Eastern Caribbean brochure. It was a two-week voyage to nearly a dozen ports. It was now winter and freezing. Two weeks in the Caribbean sounded ideal. Jen was still unwilling to spend the entire night with Brad. She'd spend a few hours at his residence before returning home. She hoped Pete would call or come over to discuss their difficulties, but Pete stated that he would not come home as long as Jan continued her romance with Brad. Brad had visited Jan's house in an attempt to spend the night with her. Janet sent her daughter to spend the evening with a girlfriend after they had settled into Pete's marital bed. The telephone had rung. It was Pete. He was furious when he found out Brad was present. Jan also burst into tears when she realized she was about to have sex with Brad on what should have been Pete's sacred land. Janet urged Brad to go and promise to see him the next day at work. Brad told Jen, Sweetheart, I have wonderful news. I just booked us for a two-week Caribbean cruise. We can enjoy ourselves without worrying about Pete's opinion. Come with me on the cruise, and I bet Pete will rush to your door to bring you back. Upon our return, you will be quite jealous. You'll have to bring him to his senses. Jan had been thinking that the whole situation with Brad was simply too expensive. Her passion had harmed the only man she loved. Above all, she felt all I needed was a little quality time with Brad and I'd be over him. Jen immediately agreed and left a note for Pete at his hotel. Pete is a baby. It is January. Look, I'm going on a two-week cruise with Brad. I believe that this will be enough quality time with him to drive the lust out of my body and thoughts when I return. I'm yours forever. Do you have that? I said forever because I will be away for two weeks. You can stay at our place and care for our daughter. Okay. By the way, the shower door still has a water leak. It is slightly larger than before, but there is still no harm to speak of. You can handle it while you're here. Remember my comment about the water bubble in the door? Yes, it is still true. Jen and Brad embarked for a two-week cruise. After ten days, Jen had had enough of Brad. With the exception of the sex, the fantasy had become a harsh reality. They shared little in common. Throughout the cruise, he treated her like a blow-up doll. When they awakened in the morning, he desired quick sex. She did not want it till they had cleaned up. His lips had a bad stench in the mornings, which put her off. She didn't sleep comfortably since Brad snored a lot. Another weakness in the armor for fantasy enthusiasts. She believed he got intoxicated on the seventh night at sea. And he hit my face with his outstretched palm after we disagreed over my quitting the affair. She reflected of her trip home. She eventually apologized, but it was far too late. After 14 days, Jen had lost interest in this fantasy. Pete. Brad is at the shower door. On the 14th day, they arrived at port and flew home. Jen hugged Brad as he delivered her to her front door in the late afternoon, and she murmured, Brad, it's over. I had my fill of you on this trip. The fantasy has died, as have the lost. All I want right now is my Pete. Thank you for a terrific time, but it's over. Brad stared at her and stated, It's over when I say it is. You either do me tonight in your bed, or you won't have a job tomorrow. Jen stood her ground. I'm opening this door and calling Pete. I'm telling him I'm sorry for how I've been acting. If you are still here after that, I hope he beats some sense into you. I know he can because he is far more manly than you are. Brad replied, You are just a big prick with a set of balls. Your behavior demonstrates a lack of respect and decency as you seek attention in ways that do not reflect well on yourself. Pete will ultimately recognize that there is a pattern in your behavior. When he leaves you, you'll crawl back, and I may let you have me with that. Brad turned and approached the car. He turned back and said, Don't bother coming to the office tomorrow. I will crate and transport your desk contents to you, along with your termination money. Jan unlocked the door and dashed into the house. She was reaching for her phone when she noticed the note on the kitchen table. It was addressed to her and written in Pete's irregular handwriting. She cautiously tore the letter from the envelope and began reading. Jan, 
You instructed me to take care of the water bubble in the shower door. First, let me clarify that you were mistaken about the bubble not inflicting visible harm, but you were correct, and establishing a link between the water bubble and your cheating on Brad. If you had been here, you would have noticed each time a water bubble appeared. It left a little residue on the glass. The material accumulated over time and clouded the glass. It had lost its clean appearance, and the clouding made it impossible to see through the glass. If you had been here, you would have noticed that the moisture eventually caused mold and mildew to develop between the panes of glass. There is now a massive black spot on the glass. It is not only unsightly, but it is also harmful to be around, similar to our marriage. Your activities have obscured our marriage and created toxic circumstances. As with the shower door, there are two options. Choose one. Repair the door. Take it apart and reassemble it. The option to replace the door. Looking at our marriage, option one was a possibility, until you chose to take a two-week cruise with your lover. Thereafter, no repairs were possible. In my head, decision two was my decision. I'm replacing the shower door. I'm taking over your position. I'm replacing our marriage. If you hadn't gone on your love cruise, you would have discovered your daughter in me, ready to try to save the marriage. However, after introducing mold and mildew as a result of your continuing infidelity on the cruise, the only option is to completely replace everything. Your acts are not only unhealthy, but also detrimental to my feelings for you. You have destroyed my feelings for you. Stephanie and I departed on the third day of your cruise. We are now living in an area where you will have difficulty finding us. My attorney will send you divorce paperwork on the day your trip ends. The reasons are adultery. The cabin steward on the cruise has been deposed, as have the residents of Brad's apartment complex, regarding your antics. In addition, the desk clerks at the different hotels where you conducted your early liaisons have testified, and your infidelity. I even have an audio tape of you speaking with me on the phone. In your failed attempts to persuade me that your actions were only sexual, I reported Brad to his employer for using his position to have sex with you. He will be dismissed for cause when he returns to the office. His employer has offered me a compensation to resolve the situation. I have no doubt Brad will try to pressure you into more sex. I believe he will eventually fire you if you do not give him what he wants and expects of you. If he is dismissed, he will no longer have any authority over you, either at work or in your personal life. So, hopefully, you'll be able to keep your employment, albeit the staff will most likely be aware of the situation. I hope you have a thick skin, because your job will be your sole source of income. You were correct. The water bubble is an accurate depiction of your actions and outcomes. If I were you, I would look through the shower door to see if you could ever discover the man I married. You can have the house if you can pay the mortgage. I've signed my portion of the house. Let me turn it over to you. You may now bring your friends with benefits into what was once our house without feeling guilty. I grabbed half of the furnishings so Stephanie and I could set up our own home. You can talk to Stephanie when we've settled in, but I have to insist that she never comes to the house when there are men around. Pete, you aren't a good role model for your soon-to-be ex-wife. Jan dropped the letter and collapsed to her knees on the floor. She had allowed sexual lust to trump the rational half of her mind. She had lost her lovely marriage as well as her best friend as a result of her animalistic reactions to Brad. She now had nothing but an empty house and a shower door with a water bubble filled with mold and mildew. A giant dark black mark appeared on the glass door and grew larger with each passing day. She knew she'd never repair the shower door since it served as a reminder of how wrong she had been. Story two, ma'am, we need to discuss. Ambush occurred on a Sunday evening as we were preparing to go to bed. I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised, given that my wife of four years, Jeanette, had been acting strangely all weekend. I asked her several times whether she was feeling unwell. I feel okay now. To be honest, I have a lot on my mind right now. So did I. The Great Recession had taken a toll on both of our careers, and we went from having enough money to make dreams come true to barely making them a reality. Not that any of our colleagues were performing any better. However, Jeanette was struggling to accept her financial setback. She grew up without and was accustomed to the luxuries we enjoyed, such as an annual vacation. She never came right out and accused me. But then I heard it in the comments that accompanied any talk about our finances. I placed my arms around Jeanette, telling her how much I loved her. 
She did not acknowledge the feeling. Instead, she acted utterly out of character. She stood up and poured herself a hard shot of scotch. She did not offer me one. I knew she had something big and horrible to tell me, and she was struggling to get the confidence to begin. After dinner, we watched television in solitude, the remainder of the evening. I had no notion what programs were on. All I could do was worry for my wife. We went upstairs without viewing the news. That generally indicated that we were going to make love. Tonight was not typical. Unfortunately, neither had a night in over three weeks. Our romantic life was a victim of the economics. I was just finishing brushing my teeth when she stepped into the bathroom and announced that someone at work had invited me on an all-expenses-paid ski trip to Colorado. One of the group had to beg off, and the tickets are non-refundable. We leave Wednesday morning, and I'll be back on Monday. I washed my lips and answered, Is anyone at work? That's an interesting way to frame things. It leads me to believe it was a man who asked you. Jeanette appeared extremely guilty. I believe you answered my question. So what is the name of the individual at work that invited you? A married woman to accompany him on vacation? I tried to be calm. You don't know him? I assumed I knew everyone you worked with, do you? But I don't really work with him. Now you've got me perplexed. You mentioned someone from work, Dot. No, I did not, she complained. I told someone at work. Okay, Bill Clinton, it depends on the word's meaning, he is. Who is the son of the person who invited you to go on vacation? I met him in the cafeteria at work. His office is on the fifth floor, and we've eaten lunch together several times. I tried so hard not to lose control, but my voice filled the room. How long have you had an affair? Jeanette started crying between sobs. She managed to say, I will never cheat on you. How could you say anything so hurtful? Perhaps you forgot to mention that you've been having lunch with another man, or that you've become such close friends. He invited you, a married woman, to ski in Colorado with him. We haven't made love in about a month. I think that's about all. It isn't like that. He's a very kind guy. However, his girlfriend dumped him and he does not want to waste the ticket. Everything has already been paid for. Hotel lift tickets? It will cost me nothing. Isn't it convenient? So, what is his name? I let out a loud thunderclap. John. Does John have a last name? Johnson or Jackson? Something like that. You've gotten me so upset that I can't think. So you want to go across the nation with a man whose name you do not know? You're either screwing him or you're an idiot. At some time, the dispute became really heated and passionate. I inquired as to who these friends were that would be sharing this cabin with John's friends. There are two other couples, two other couples. That indicates you're going to be his date now. I keep telling you that he doesn't want to squander his non-refundable ticket. So he invited a married woman to be his date. Why aren't you trusting me? Would you trust me if I told you? I met a woman in the cafeteria who urged me to go on vacation with her. Yes. Remember how envious you were when I explained the infield fly rule to the lovely woman sitting next to us at Wrigley Field last summer? Did you initiate a quarrel with her? The ushers threw us out of the park. That was different. You were ignoring me. Oh, and you are not going to ignore me while sharing a cabin with John and four total strangers. Jeanette yelled and stormed out of the room. It was a long and sleepless night. Jeanette and I tossed and turned until approximately two when we both fell asleep. I got up at six and made a pot of coffee brute. She poured a cup, took a drink, put it in the sink, and said, I'm off to work. When my wife dug in her heels, I realized she'd rather lose an argument than acknowledge she was wrong. She was the most stubborn person I'd ever encountered. I spent the trip to work devising a plan to save my marriage. I understood that appealing to reasoning would not succeed. This required a strong, sharp kick in the pants, as my grandma would say. About a year ago, I took a chance on hiring a street-smart young man who had spent time in the county jail for stealing a convenience shop. He kept reminding me that he owed me large money for taking a chance on an ex-con. You say it, boss, and I will do it, he constantly said. I chose to call in that marker. Julio, I need a favor. Tell me what it is, and it's finished. I described my position to Julio. Do you want me to mess him up? Perhaps later. But first, I need his name and where he works. I provided him a photo of my wife and the address of her office building. There is a cafeteria in the basement. She has lunch every day at 12 o'clock. I need you to take a photo of John without being seen. When he finishes eating, I want you to follow him upstairs and see where he goes. Please provide me the name of his employer. I get it. Boss. 
Then, at the end of the day, I want you to follow him and collect the license plate number of his automobile. I am your man, boss. And Julio. Do not worry. I will take care of your time card. I kept checking my watch. I was confident Jeanette would meet up with her boyfriend and tell him how crazy I was. It was a typical Monday. I was swamped with work, yet time dragged on at 110. My telephone rang. Boss, it's me. I received the photo. I couldn't get close enough to hear what they were saying. When they finished, I followed him to the elevator. He pretended I wasn't even there. I got off when he did, pretending to look for a room number. He ducked into 510. The sign read, Anderson Metallurgy Supplies, LLC. Julio, you did an excellent job, but you're barely halfway done. Do not worry, boss. I will follow him like a shadow. Send me a photo. When I hung up, I opened Google on my screen. I wasn't really optimistic. As I typed, John Johnson. I received a bunch of name matches, but none matched the photo. Next, I tried John Jackson. No luck. The names were as ubiquitous as dirt. So I contacted Anderson Metallurgy Supplies, LLC, and I discovered they were one of the industry's largest producers of powdered metals, whatever that means. They didn't have any employee names or pictures, so I contacted the stated number and inquired for John Johnson. There is no one here with that name. I apologize. I'm usually perplexed about those. I meant John Jackson. There is no one here with that name either. Do you have the right company? I must have phoned incorrectly. I'm sorry to have troubled you. I was staring at the computer, trying to figure out who that son of a bitch was when my phone rang again. Boss, it's me. After we hung up, I went into the men's room to smoke. I suppose you followed me. Jackson, Johnson. However, none of them are his genuine name. Did he see you? I was in the store getting ready to light up when he walked in. I observed him through the gap between the wall and the door. He urinated but didn't wash his hands. As he walked out, the guy my age walked in and said hello, Mr. Johnson. He didn't say anything, so I waited until he departed and said, Hey, was it John Jackson? He answered, No, man, he's Robert Johnson. Looks like a real jerk. You've got that right. He burned the cigarette and I hid it outdoors. Coolio, you make an excellent spy. Thank you, boss. Unfortunately, I was called into a logistics meeting that lasted until leaving time, so I couldn't devote any time to research, which would have to wait until the morning. Julio called while I was backing into the garage. He exited the elevator shortly before three, and I followed him across the parking lot to the subway station. The train was busy, so I hung out at the other end of the car with a group of Mexicans who spoke Spanish. I believe Jensen was terrified to look at us. He sat with his briefcase on his lap as if we were trying to steal it. He got off at Logan Square, and I followed him home. He resides in the basement unit of a two-flat approximately a block from the boulevard at 2366 North Kimball Avenue. It has burglar bars, but no curtains on the windows, allowing me to look inside. It's a real dump. I had nothing better to do, so I waited in the gangway next door to see if he had gone anywhere. About five minutes later, he pulled out a stack of pizza boxes and dumped them into the rubbish can. Then he came out with two massive rubbish bags. After he went inside, I grabbed both of them. This is how my pals take identities. People throw away too much good leadership. I'm not sure who Jackson Johnson is, but I have a number of legal-looking documents that state his name is Robert Jensen. Julio, that's good work. I can't talk right now. We'll discuss everything tomorrow. Okay, boss? What I now knew sparked an idea. I stepped in and discovered Jeanette eating hamburgers and fries at the kitchen table, she did not appear to have bought anything for me. I ignored the slight and sat across from her, in order for us to have a sensible conversation. I make various demands. Jeanette started to speak, but I told her to wait until I finished. Then she could speak. It was all she wanted. I am not stupid. I have not forgotten how you phrased your vacation notice, to give me the impression that you were going with a co-worker. So it is time for complete disclosure. I need John's last name, address, email, cell phone number, and workplace. Next, I'll need copies of his airline tickets and the address of the mountain lodge he rented. If something happened to you, God forbid. I do not want to have to inform the police. I let my wife go somewhere in Colorado, but I'm not sure where or with whom. Don't go too theatrical. I stopped her again. I'll speak first, then you. It constantly irritated my wife when I refused to let her talk over me. I also want the names and phone numbers of the other couples. 
Now you may respond. He did not rent the chalet. It belonged to his uncle. And John does not own a cell phone. What do you mean? Five-year-old children have cell phones. Everyone else succeeds, but he fails. So if I get you all of this, will you stop bullying me and allow me to have fun? Her face lit up. She smiled. You have one day to bring me everything. Why don't you admit your jealousy? Because I'm going to Colorado. I smashed my fist against the table. I'm not jealous. I'm upset because we were dating for a long period. You never mentioned going skiing anywhere during our four-plus years of marriage. So come hell or high water, do you want to go skiing in Colorado with this strange guy you met in the cafeteria? And you wonder why I believe you are having an affair. I swear I am not, she yelled. Give me the details. If everything checks out, we'll discuss. I was tempted to tell her that her boyfriend had given her a bogus name, but I wanted to see how Jensen would react. We slept about as far apart as a queen-size mattress would allow. However, Jeanette was polite the next morning, and we drank coffee together. I came early at the workplace and paced the floor until Julie arrived. Jeanette was going tomorrow, and this was my last chance to rescue our marriage. Julio brought a large cardboard box to work. He had sorted through the bags and discarded the true waste. The remainder consisted of items that should never be discarded. Financial documents, checking account statements, and certified mail from a lawyer's office. He ripped the envelopes in half, as if that will deter an identity thief. I went through and taped everything back together that appeared important and arranged it in some sort of order. The first thing he offered me was a legal-sized envelope for certified mail to Robert Jensen. That man is being dragged to court for failing to pay child support. He has two young children and hasn't paid her a penny in over a year. The following item was a bench warrant for failing to appear for non-payment of child support, Julio explained. The police are so busy that they would not even come to your house to pick you up. What they do is enter your name into the database. If you have had any contact with the police, including a driving ticket, they take you to jail. So I suppose I'll have to arrange for him to meet some of Chicago's best. Julio laughed at this. Good idea, boss. Boss. Then came a package of overdraft notices and checks that had been returned stamped NSF. He received about a dozen notifications from the bank before they terminated his account. Julio saved the best until last a printout of the airline reservation. It's odd. His ticket is round trip. However, your wife's is only one way. That's not good, boss. With the wrecker identifier, you can cancel the tickets. I had another notion. I would separate the lovebirds by moving Johnson's seat to the back of the plane and purchasing the newly available one for myself. After we finished reviewing all of the records, I searched the Chicago Tribune archives and discovered why Jensen used a fictitious identity. Despite the fact that the attack occurred in Denver, he was convicted of a sexual offense. Jensen was from Chicago, and all three daily newspapers ran the story with his mugshot. There was no doubt that it was him. They didn't go into too much detail because the victim was spared a trial thanks to a plea agreement. He pled guilty to a lesser charge of sexual assault and was sentenced to 24 months in prison as a guest at the Graybar Hotel. His wife divorced him. A visit to the sex offender registry confirmed his home address. It was stated that he was released after only 14 months owing to jail overcrowding. The first thing he did was locate down his ex-wife and beat her so viciously that she was hospitalized for about a month. Two felony convictions. And my wife thinks he's a very nice man. I had an early lunch and walked down to the courtroom to purchase a copy of Jensen's divorce decree. It cost 25 cents each sheet to photocopy. The application includes a copy of his arrest warrant for sexual assault. He drugged and attacked the young lady he had gone skiing with. I also looked into do-it-yourself divorce paperwork at the law library. I discovered a wonderful template online and completed it for funding. I claimed adultery and provided time-stamped images of them in the cafeteria. Instead of eating, they spoke for an hour like two lovers. My final destination was the Circuit Court of Cook County Domestic Relations Division where I submitted my petition for marriage dissolution. I had three duplicates made, each with the official seal and case number stamped on them. I informed my boss that I would need a few personal days off. He's a wonderful man who didn't ask. Word. Jeanette was preparing dinner when I walked in. It was a proper dinner, not something out of a box. I suppose she was attempting to put me in a good mood. I hugged and kissed her. She responded not as well as I had hoped, but it was better than nothing. 
Jeanette reached inside her purse and removed a folded piece of paper. I've received everything you desired. As I previously stated, John Johnson does not have a phone, but I can provide you with his email address and Facebook page. Where does he work? He has been promoted and has received his new business cards. Yet. I looked at her like she had two heads, but no brain. He also couldn't tell you his employer's name. I opened my laptop and went directly to Google Maps. I inputted Shelley's address, strike one. Then I used the official Denver zoning map, strike two. I continued to test every mapping program I could find. Honey, I called out. There appears to be an issue. I ran the Shelley address through six mapping applications and the assessor's website, and everyone agrees there is no such address. He must have changed a digit or something. How about the tickets, she said. He suggested we could acquire those at the airport. You will now receive your boarding pass at the airport. You know this from our trip to Maui. Next, I dialed the phone numbers he provided for the other two couples. Neither was a working number. I attempted to search for the names online, but came up empty-handed. I had no better luck with Facebook. I'm sorry, honey, but I don't have any information. Johnson, if that is the name he gave you, is genuine. That indicates I won't let you go. Foolish me. I expected her to admit there was something fishy about Johnson. The next thing I knew, my dinner, still in the frying pan, had flown by and collided with the wall. Too bad it smelled so wonderful. You aren't allowing me, she yelled. Who the heck are you to tell me where I can and cannot go? Your hubby. Why are you acting so unreasonable? All I'm doing is going skiing with a friend. A man has lied to you about everything. You're not even sure where you're headed. He did not. Why? Maybe he doesn't want you to cause issues. Is he worried I'll turn up and spoil your love nest? Is seductive. Jeanette lost it. She spit out of her mouth as she ranted. Stop saying it. We will never be more than buddies. I'm going skiing and you won't stop me. Want to go skiing? Fine. I will take you skiing. With what money? We're broke. Remember? I have two mayonnaise jars full of silver coins that I've saved since I was a teenager. I was planning to spend them on a vacation for our fifth anniversary. I'll get them in now, and either spend the money on a vacation with my wife or hire a divorce counsel. It's your decision. Stop threatening me. I am not threatening you. I'm making a solemn vow, and you know I keep my word. I do not comprehend. Why aren't you trusting me? You are a beautiful woman. Johnson has revealed himself to be less than a gentleman by refusing to back down when he found that your husband did not want his wife to accompany him on vacation. I told you that he is only taking me since the ticket is non-refundable. I'll reimburse him for the ticket and leave enough money for us to go skiing. It is too late. We are leaving tomorrow morning and I have no method of contacting them. Jeanette, I am not stupid. I will not be slain by you. A man who allows his wife to do everything she wants is not a real man. Consider how you will explain to your parents, family, and friends why you are getting divorced. Do not give me that. I promised you I'd come home relaxed and make it up to you. Please, I ask you. It is not too late to save our marriage. I told you that I couldn't cancel. I promised John we would go, and it is too late for him to find someone else. So you'll maintain your pledge to a known liar at the expense of the vow we made in front of God, our friends, and family. I keep assuring you that nothing is going to happen. It doesn't matter if nothing occurs. You've made your choice. You chose him over our marriage. I spent the night on the sofa. I could hear Jeanette crying in her bedroom. My mind was in conflict with my heart. The logical half of me wanted to let her get wounded and gloat over the corpse when the unavoidable occurred while the emotional component told me to be the knight in shining armor and save my marriage, I spent a sleepless night pondering which option I preferred. In the end, I chose to compromise. I was awake before the sun. Jeanette ignored me. I really annoyed her when I took a picture of you with my phone. Why did you do that? She demanded. So the police will have a recent picture in case they need to identify your body. She let out a string of curses. I entered the bedroom as she was packing her suitcase. If you board the plane with him, I won't be there when you return. Pack, our marriage will end. She sent me a filthy look and added, I know you're not that stupid. Funny. I had the same thoughts about you. I suppose we were both mistaken. I walked away without kissing her goodbye. I parked my car down the street and watched her leave. Then I went back inside to shave my distinguishing beard and mustache. Next, I dressed in my black suit, white shirt, and slim black tie. My wife referred to this as my burial clothes, which seemed appropriate given that I would be witnessing the end of her marriage.
A pair of sunglasses completed my disguise. I grabbed my briefcase and a couple of suitcases packed with my clothes and set out for the final roll of the dice. Julio called a few minutes after eight, and I was at the gate. He was outside Johnson's basement apartment. Boss, you're not going to believe this. They got into a heated quarrel. Your wife wanted to drive to the airport, but the chauffeur suggested the train was cheaper. She even offered to pay for parking, but he encouraged her to save her money because they'd need it when they reached Colorado. I examined her wallet while she was in the restroom. She had less than $100. I hope she didn't intend to use her shared credit cards because I canceled them shortly after I purchased my ticket. I wish I could read Jeanette's thoughts as she carried the tote bags down the steps to the dark underground labyrinth. Chicagoans refer to the subway. The Blue Line train would be jam-packed with commuters on their way to work. Julio assumed a man flying to Denver to go skiing in December lacked an appropriate winter clothing or even gloves as he observed them jostled by the crowd. Jeanette's fantasy trip was already on shaky terrain. The ride took slightly more than 30 minutes. Julio followed them to the terminal and watched Jensen print their boarding permits. Fortunately, he didn't look at them too closely and didn't notice. I altered his seat location just before I purchased my ticket. Julio called again to say they had reached the TSA checkpoint and he couldn't go any farther. Thank you for everything. You have been a big assistance. The screener at the x-ray machine identified Jeanette's carry-on luggage. Please step over here, ma'am. Soon, a minimum wage worker started rummaging through her clothing until he discovered the corkscrew. To my relief, I hid in the inside zipper pocket as I rifled through the bags to see what she'd packed. There was nothing slightly attractive. The TSA agent read her the riot act before confiscating the corkscrew. My plane would have to be perfectly timed to work. I had paid for early boarding and was among the first on the plane. I cleaned my center seat. My wife had the window seat. I agreed to give her another chance, provided she sat next to me so I could show her my evidence. Luck was on my side as the man in the aisle seat boarded a few minutes later. I was pleased to find that he was a really fit young man with a buzz cut. I gradually assumed he was a collegiate athlete. The rows ahead of us were crowded with stragglers. Looked through the overhead bins for a space to store their carry-on bags. A few minutes later, the festivities began. Hey, you asshole, you are in my seat. Jensen shoved his ticket in my seatmate's face. Jeanette had turned the other direction to force her suitcase into the overhead compartment, but she turned back when she heard the noise. The person seated in the aisle added, Look at the row number on your way back by the restroom. Jensen released a profanity-laced tirade about how inept the airline was. He kept it off with, then relocate your big ass to the back of the plane and allow me to sit next to my girlfriend. Jeanette heard him call her that, but she didn't object. Instead, she added, John, if he doesn't want to, perhaps you should ask the man in the middle to change seats without my beard and mustache. She didn't recognize me immediately. The sunglasses helped. By now, a flight attendant had forced her way through the mob, and the purser had emerged from the aft galley to investigate the disturbance. She glared at Jensen and told him to take his seat so they could complete boarding the plane. This flight is full. Please take your assigned seat, and we will see if we can relocate you after takeoff. I paid to sit beside my girlfriend. Jensen was waving a ticket. Jeanette finally noticed I was seated in the middle seat. What the hell are you doing on my flight? Did you do this? You are humiliating me. I am humiliating you. You are a married woman, and this piece of garbage is calling you his girlfriend. He simply said it to persuade him to change seats. Her voice returned to Benham. Jeanette moved to the empty row in front of me and started her tirade. I knew you would ruin my vacation. I absolutely despise you. I loathe being married to you. I thought she'd be upset, but I must be naive because I didn't expect her to say that. I felt like my soul had perished. I was shocked. Tears streamed down my cheeks as I looked my wife full in the eye. Robert Jensen is your boyfriend. He doesn't want you to know his real name since this wonderful person has an outstanding arrest warrant for failure to pay child support. I guess he could afford to take my wife on vacation because he wasn't caring for his own children. I opened my briefcase and gave her a copy of the bench warrant. You might like to read this. Jeanette examined the document. Her voice trembled. John, what is going on? Is this true? While you're at it, ask your guy why he didn't get you a return ticket. 
I handed her their schedule, indicating that hers was a one-way ticket only. Jeanette was growing concerned. John, how come I don't have a return ticket? He ignored her request and continued to argue with the flight attendant. You aren't going to tell me? You forgot to tell me. You served two years in prison for severely hitting his wife. She spent over a month in the hospital. I have photos. I showed her a few photos of a woman whose face appeared to have been hit by a truck. That very polite person did this to her. John, please tell me he is making this up. Jensen didn't respond. He was too preoccupied telling the flight attendant how he felt about her and her airline. You had better make a move or else. I was on a roll. It's amazing what you can discover when you Google someone's real name. I drew the word real name. Here are the newspaper stories, if you do not believe me. I gave her a half dozen articles. His mugshot appears in each one. In case you believe I'm making this up, I do not comprehend. Jeanette was really perplexed. Come now. Surely he told us about a registered sex offender. Damn that airplane. That was quiet as I shouted that. Let me know if this sounds familiar. He convinced a naive young lady to go skiing in Colorado. Instead, hit the slopes. He drugged her and then assaulted her in turn with his cronies. She managed to escape after a week in custody, earning him four years in prison. Jeanette was sobbing. John, please tell me that did not happen. He did not answer because he was too busy arguing with the flight attendant. Try Robert Robert Jensen. It is his real name. Jensen wasn't the brightest predator, but it seemed to have finally clicked. I had wrecked his plans. He yelled, I am going to kill you, and lunged at me. Unfortunately for him, I moved, and his punch landed hard on the flight attendant's face. In a short period of time, chaos ensued. My seatmate, who turns out to be a standout defensive tackle at a Big Ten college, was on him in an instant and detained him until Chicago's finest clamped handcuffs on his wrist. The news referred to him as a hero. As a reward, the airline upgraded them to first-class seats. Jensen discovered that attacking a member of the flight crew is a felony. Surprisingly, telling the police officer you did not intend to hit the flight attendant. You attempted to kill your girlfriend's husband. Didn't elicit much sympathy. I delivered Jeanette every single piece of damaging evidence I had gathered. I swear to God that every word I uttered is true. Jeanette stared at the pile of paperwork, not looking at them. It's over now. Let's go home. I threw my arms up, hoping she would let me hug her instead. My wife ignored the invitation and remained silent. She dropped her head and stared at the floor. She did not say a thing, not a single word. The situation worsened as cops hauled Jensen off the plane. I could hear him screaming repeatedly. Hello, Menzel. I had your wife. My eyes begged her to admit he's a liar. That never occurred. She turned away silently. An airline security guard informed Jeanette and me that we had been remanded to the custody of the Chicago Police Department for our involvement in the melee. Before we moved, I heard a flight attendant remark, please notify the gate agent. Three seats have suddenly opened up. I uttered a prayer of thanksgiving. The other passengers stared at us as we walked by. Everyone seemed to be taking pictures with their smartphones. Now Jeanette understood what it was like to be truly humiliated. She didn't say anything during her walk of shame. I don't think she was expecting what happened. I also felt numb. My knees were collapsing, and I had to concentrate on walking. I somehow managed to keep my head up. I wanted everyone to know that I had done everything I could. Everything went just as planned. Well, nearly anything. I saved Jeanette but lost my wife. The police moved us to different rooms for questioning. Homeland security officers were also present. I spent the next hour telling what I knew about Jensen. The detective said, wait here and then left me alone with a cup of stale coffee for the next two hours as they called their colleagues in Denver. I paced back and forth like a convict debating the margin with myself. Did my wife have sex with Jensen, or did that witch's son toss it out to destroy us? If she didn't do it, why didn't she say anything? On and on. The discussion heated. When the detective eventually returned, he stated that they found a really receptive audience in Colorado. Your wife vomited all over herself. I showed her images. They sent over the chalet, a tar paper hut in the back of an auto junkyard, as well as what they had in store for her inside. Jensen had four infamous buddies and two couples awaiting their arrival. They had secured the shack with handcuffs and shackles so she couldn't flee. 
we discovered enough sedatives stashed in his suitcase to knock out a circus elephant for a week. It did not take much convincing to persuade them to reveal their plans for his next victim. It would not have gone well for your wife, the detective murmured, her face devoid of color as they read her their confessions. Then she passed out. When he was finished, the investigator asked if I wanted to use the room for a private conversation with my wife, based on the tone of his voice. I knew that was the question. Yes, sir. I unlocked the locks on my briefcase and took out the divorce petition. What is that? The detective inquired. I threatened to divorce Jeanette if she boarded the plane with Jensen. Do you have no compassion? That woman's broken. Damn near suicidal. She's shocked to realize how close she came to being murdered. You claimed you did all of this to salvage your marriage. You'll ruin her if you give her that. I was unaffected. The part of me that loved her had perished. She was well aware that she had made a serious mistake. Right now, you are the good guy. You executed an outstanding plan to save your wife. You are a regular Liam Neeson. You can't walk away from her. I interrupted the silence. I intend to present these to her. Their love nest. However, consider the current situation. Even after everything she's done, if Jeanette says I'm sorry, I'm going to rip these up today. But I still intend to divorce her. I offer you my word, but you can't tell her. You've received my word. A minute later, he took my wife into the room. I caught a brief look before she buried her face in her hands. She looked like death and smelled like puke. She sank onto the chair and started sobbing. The detective lorded over her, saying, Mrs. Menzel, I've been a cop for over 29 years, and what you did was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard of. If anyone ever deserved to be slain, it was you. With every breath you take, thank God for your husband and the heartbeat he gave you. You owe him the rest of your life. He closed the door on his way out. The only sound was my wife swallowing air between sobs. Not one word. Not a thank you. Not that I apologize. Nothing. After approximately five minutes, I got tired of waiting for her to speak. You gave up our marriage for a ski trip costing less than $1,500. That's what our dreams were worth after this. How can I ever trust you not to abandon me for the next sparkling bauble? My mind was pleading for her to speak. She did not say a thing. As I waited for her to say something, tears flowed down my face. Anything. When I couldn't stand it any longer, I said, if you had ever said sorry, I would have torn this paper up. I cannot wait any longer. I gave her a copy of the divorce decree. Jeanette screamed out loud when she read it. The detective dashed back inside to make sure she was okay. I've already packed my clothing, anything I had left behind. You can donate or trash away. I handed her the keys to our apartment and walked away. I never looked back. The next time I saw her was in court. The judge ordered us to attend counseling. I reluctantly agreed, but I had no intention of reconciling with her. During the sessions, the counselor observed how manipulative my ex-wife was. As intended, the sessions failed, and after seven months, I was free. I never heard from Jeanette again, not that I wanted to. Jensen was charged with conspiracy with the intent to hurt someone. He is still serving his sentence. I hope they keep him there permanently. Thank you for listening to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, write a comment below with your thoughts on what transpired. Take care.